thesis that is at least in part derived from the book that I've just published. My name's David Goodhart. I work here at Policy Exchange. I've also just published a book called Head, Hand, Heart. I always forget the subtitle. The subtitle is The Struggle for Dignity and Status in the 21st Century. Uh, one, uh, one expression, so the basic thesis is kind of in the title. I argue that one form of human aptitude one form of human skill, if you like, has become too much the gold standard of human esteem, cognitive, analytical ability. And one expression of the overdomination of this aptitude in our economy, culture, society is the overexpansion, I argue, of higher education in recent years. We've, we've narrowed the definition of a successful life, I think, too much to doing well at school, passing exams, going to a good university, having more or less successful cognitive professional career. Uh, there's a single ladder into this zone of, of, um, of, of, of security and, and success in, in our society, um, and, uh, and, and a single ladder into it through higher education. I think that has uh, it's contributed to the value divides in our society. Uh, so that we have, we suffer from, or rather we have, I think, not paid sufficient attention to what I call the 1550 problem when only 15% of people in your school or town went to university and you didn't, it didn't matter so much. When, when nearly 50% of school leavers go and you don't, then that's a very big psychological difference. And no one seemed to think about that very much in 1999 when Tony Blair made his famous speech saying we must send 50% of school leavers to university. Um, this has not always been dysfunctional. I think you know, we have to put this in historical context. I think if you go back 20 or 30 years, the expansion of higher education reflected the, the demand for, for middling and higher cognitive skills from a large proportion of, of the population. Uh, it, it, made, it made sense. Uh, and there were the jobs for people to go into after they graduated. Um, um, but now I think we've reached what I call peak head. Um, and it turns out the knowledge economy doesn't need so many knowledge workers. We haven't even yet had the, a great wave of AI. AI is eating into a few jobs at the margin, but we have other signals, I think, that we have overproduced uh, a certain kind of um, academically qualified person. You can see that in the declining the decline in the graduate income premium, particularly for those who don't go to Russell Group universities. You can see it in the fact that 30% of graduates are still in non-graduate employment nearly between five and 10 years after graduating. And that's with a very, very elastic definition of a graduate job too. Um, meanwhile, we have huge skill shortages in skilled trades, middling technical functions. Uh, indeed, one of the reasons possibly for, our, for the testing system uh, you know, to, to make this point very current, the, the, the troubles we're having with our testing system may at least in part be down to the fact we do not have enough of those white-coated lab technicians. We've got lots of academic scientists. Do we have enough you know, white-coated lab technicians? It seems that we may not. Maybe one of the problems there. And of course, we have huge recruitment crises in a lot of caring occupations, in nursing, in, in social care, and so on. You know, we're going to need hundreds of thousands of dementia, specialist dementia nurses in a few years' time. And yet, despite all these trends that have been pretty clear now, I think, for a few years, we're still, the, 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 the system is in sort of automatic pilot. We're still sending 40 45%, even despite the pandemic, or perhaps because of the pandemic, um, more kids uh, than ever are going into higher education. And there's obviously a logic to it. Um, not only is the idea for a lot of you know, particularly middle class kids, it's become a kind of a rite of passage, you know, he's three years away from, from home, you know, partly at taxpayers' expense. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Um, and also 40% of, of jobs in our economy are now graduate only. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a very, very strong, and of course all of the, it's very simple, you know, great avenue, great motorway that directs you culturally and, and uh, all the cultural signals, all the financial incentives take you one way. Um, but our HE system, I think it's, it's an outlier in two, an in international <coughs> outlier in two really important respects. One in the very high proportion of kids that are residential, 
uh, students, it's 75-80% according to the Higher Education Policy Institute report of a few months ago, and we have a single system. We don't, m most other countries have a much more differentiated post-school education system. They still have versions of the polytechnics that we turned into universities in 1992. Um, so what is the answer? I mean, I would like, I would, I'd be very interested in hearing, um, we've got four um, um, very uh, interesting uh, speakers um, uh, who I will very briefly introduce. Uh, we've got uh, John McDonnell, obviously known to everybody, former Shadow Chancellor. We've got Emma Hardy, MP, uh, who is the Shadow Minister for FE and Universities. Uh, we have John McTernan, um, well-known commentator, former uh, advisor both to Tony Blair and, of course, to Julia Gillard, the other end of the planet. Um, and uh, we have Alan Francis, my friend Alan Francis, who is the um, principal of Oldham College, the, the FE College in Oldham. Um, and we will um, be hearing from um, all of them in a sec. I mean, just to remind you out there, uh, if you want to make a comment or ask a question, then use the, use the, the the, the Zoom function that allows you to do that. I think you should all know how to do that by now. Um, so, um, um, just, to, just to wind up what I was saying, so what is the answer? I mean, I think part of the answer is, is, is in the Augur review, actually. Um, a, a, a very good review. When was it produced now? About a year ago. Um, looking, at the, looking at how we have got We've, we've got out of alignment, uh, both economically and, I think, culturally and politically. Orga didn't actually say this, but uh, so we're, we're producing... I mean, higher education has become too much a, a system of credentialization. We're producing too many people who don't actually have the skills that the, the modern economy now requires. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, we have all these, these huge skill shortages, so it's, it's become economically dysfunctional. It's also, I think, become politically dysfunctional in that we're producing... Uh, a generation of people with disappointed expectations, people who feel that they've done the right thing, they've, they've worked hard, they've gone to college, and they are not, though, getting the kind of employment that they were expecting. They are, many of them doing, particularly if you've done a humanities degree, you, 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 you may well be going into a, uh, a, a kind of routine, um, clerical, administrative type, type function, getting paid 22 grand a year, and this is not at all what you expected. Uh, so you, we, we've got a crisis of expectations, and that's, that's potentially a, a political problem, um, and, and we've got an economic problem too. So, I mean, I think, I mean, I would certainly favour, I don't want to close down the universities. Um, we, you know, we need post-Brexit Britain, you know, we'll have to live on its wits. We need, um, we need high intelligence, we need excellent um, elite research universities. The question is more um, the, for the kind of middle and lower cognitive levels, have, uh, have we over-expanded them for jobs that are not there and that actually people would be both happier and, and better and probably more remuneratively employed in, in other roles? Um, and that doesn't, I mean, that, that partly requires just going back in some ways to the more flexible post-school offer that we had 30 years ago, uh, more sandwich courses, more part-time courses, and also just getting away from this ridiculous idea that everyone has to go into higher education at the age of 18, 19. I mean, it, it's so palpably a waste for so many people because they're not, they're not mature enough to take advantage of it. You know, we should follow, you know, countries like Israel, where partly because of national service, people tend to go to university much later when they can actually benefit from it and they can really, um, they, you know, they, they actually want to be there uh, to, in order to learn. Um, um, so I think, you know, this, this is, I'm not, I, I mean, I'm certainly not calling for a revolution here. I think we can, we can adjust around the edges. We need, a, we need a much better, I know Alan Francis has been thinking about this, we need a much better relationship between FE and HE. We need to, we need to invest in FE, but we also need to have the two sectors collaborating better to produce the more, um, the more effective and, and, as I say, often perhaps sandwich part-time, um, you know, getting older workers back into the, into the system to, to raise their skills and so on, all, all of these things that we're not doing sufficiently at the moment. Anyway, that is more than enough from me. Um, sorry, I've probably gone on rather too long. Um, but let's hear now from our, our four guests. And 
let me ask, uh, let, let, actually let me uh, ask John McDonnell first as, as the, senior, the senior political figure uh, who we have um, uh, in this conversation. John, over to you. Hey, if it catch up, I'm a humble backbencher <laughs> at the moment. If senior, I think that's an ageist comment or anything like that. <laughs> Thanks for the book. Um, I read the book. Um, I recommend it to people. Um, I recommend reading that, but alongside it, I also recommend reading um, David, well, my late friend, David, uh, David Graeber's book, Bullshit Jobs, as well. Um, David died a few weeks ago, tragically, but uh, it, I think in tandem, they read very well together. I, like all things, I went, I went straight to your final chapter before I read the other chapters. And your final chapter read like the um, Labour Party manifesto in 2019, so be very careful. You won't be elected on that page. <laughs> it, was, it was, I thought, extra. I just say I'm not bullying you at all. Uh, alongside your other book, I find it incredibly stimulated, and I do recommend it as a good read. I want to just take you back very quickly because uh, in some ways um, what you've just said, it's almost like my life passing in front of me, really, because I was out of that generation um, that we had the 11 plus, and, and I, I think me and my brother were the only two in our school that got through the 11 plus. Um, and then what then happened, the brutality of the 11 plus meant that the, the theory was very much based upon your point of head, heart, and hand, this cognitive, this caring, and then the physical ability, dexterity to do things with your hand. Because it, once you pass the 11 plus, you then got swept off to grammar school to this um, education, which was a reflection of almost a public school education. My mates um, who never got through the 11 plus then went off to tech school. Can you remember those? Because mm. that's what you were meant to be able to do. And then others went to the secondary modern because they were just going to be factory products. And that's how we got differentiated at that age. And I'm always fearful of these discussions that we're going to revert to that if we're not careful because it then in installed within our, re re sort of reinstated within our society or reinforced within our society that sort of hierarchy and class divisions as well. And although there was an element of social mobility, that sort of thing, actually, I'm not into social mobility. I actually believe we should all rise up together rather than any individuals just plucked out of their class in that way. And then for my generation, you refer to them, actually, um, when um, I was on the shop floor uh, and did my A-levels, et cetera, on, on the shop floor and then went off to university. But I, we, I went up to Brunel. Brunel was an old um, poly that then got converted into a university. And the reason I went to Brunel, I think I had the grace to go elsewhere, but the reason I went to Brunel, because it was a sandwich pool. You work for six months and you study for six months. And I was married and um, early 20s at that time. And to be honest, I need the money. I need to work for a period of time as well for the year. And it suited me. But um, the old pollies, whatever you thought of them, they were still looked down upon from the educational heights of the universities themselves. They, Although I think they produced some wonderful results in terms of, as you say, technicians, those with the brown and the, the white coats, etc. Uh, and they gave a lot of working class people an opportunity to really develop their skills in a whole range of directions. They were still looked upon as inferior to universities themselves. And I think that's the problem, really, this hierarchy of esteem. And you've done, I think you've really emphasized that in the book really well. The thing at the moment, what's interesting, and I think we have to relate it to the real world as we now live in it, the COVID crisis has made us reevaluate all of that hasn't it? All of a sudden, you know, we really are, we really are have to work out what do we really and who do we really value in our society. And the point you make in your, your book, actually the heart is more, is, we've now recognised the heart and the caring professions, the caring jobs are so much more valued than uh, now than before they were the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. in, ter in terms of the hand as well, I have to say as well, the technical ability to produce the test results, as you say, is, I think as well, just on the ground, the ability to be able to use people's skills and dexterities and insights at the local level has demonstrated to me just how actually we, our valuations within our society 
are completely askew. And you can see how that's arisen, both from our education system, but as a reflection of our class system as well. Mm. And the reason New Labour went to um, the development of uh, the 50% going to university um, was, I think, was a rightful attack on the class system within our society. Why couldn't working class kids have the opportunity of a few years out learning more broadly? And if it, to be honest, most people who do their first degree don't go on and get a job related to that degree. That period is actually enabling them to have a much wider range of educational experience and actually for youngsters as well to mature a bit as well on, as they stand on their own to the beat after the first time. So that's why New Labour was right to say, let's expand university access. The issue for us, though, is in doing that, we didn't change the universities themselves to meet the economic needs and social and, I agree with you, cultural and political needs that our society has went as well. So that's the job we now have to do, I think, is look at the institutions themselves and see, do they meet, um, yes, what we need economically, culturally, socially and politically within our society, and how do we redesign them? But also, I think there is an argument for ensuring that we do allow our young people that opportunity, or as many as possible, that opportunity of those few years of intensive study and development of maturity as well, and actually enjoyment too. I think it is a coming of age experience. We need to relate it more, of course, to our economy. But at the same time, we've got to make sure that when we do that, there is an equality of esteem. And I think that's beginning to emerge now. Uh, certainly over the debates over the, this last period. Mm. It does translate back into the secondary and um, primary education as well, because, again, the point that you raised about testing in particular is about what are we testing people for. Actually, I want, I want to, uh, an appreciation of not just how much a child is pumping out in a particular test, but also how they relate to one another and how they care for one another and how they integrate within within their local community, within that school as well, a much more wider evaluation of what education has given them about the enjoyment of education, culture, arts, all of those from all of those areas of activity as well. Mm. But the other point you make in your um, final chapter, which I really do swing into really, is you quote Haldane from the Bank of England and the ability to, to yes, if necessary, when you're younger, take those few years out and, and study at whether it's university or whatever the institutions we call, whatever institutional change we have, but also the commitment to lifelong learning, which we've all had but never really implemented. We've never really encouraged people to make a decision in their lives about when is best for them to study or when is best for them to return to study and training. So I think that commitment to lifelong learning is most probably central to the way that we're going now, mm. particularly in the, the development of, as you say, of artificial intelligence, because as artificial intelligence and new technology expands almost exponentially, it is invading territories of professions that we've never seen before. Um, five years ago, I did a seminar at the House of Commons and my shadow of treasury team then was made up mostly of lawyers. And what happened in that, one of the people in that seminar did a lecture of just about how much legal work now was being overtaken by artificial intelligence. Uh, most of the lawyers in my team sat very uncomfortably that they might be out of a job in a few years' time. But actually, I think that the whole idea of lifelong learning is to not just to provide people with opportunities, but to enable us to keep up with the developments within our economy, particularly in relation to new technology and the development of artificial intelligence. Mm. So, I, in my view now, it's I don't I think we've got to ensure that we encourage the ambition of our youngsters and others to maximise the opportunities that they can through education and training. Of course, it's got to reflect what we need within our society, but it isn't just about churning out, as you've said in your book, it isn't just about churning out financiers, making sure it's that range of our needs, and it is about the creativity and the care that we need within our community. And we've got to enable access to, we've got to enable access throughout life to that. So it's more about now a discussion about the institutional arrangements, and I think those institutional arrangements are about how those institutions reflect parity of esteem across head, hand and heart, as you've reflected in the book, but also how they reflect the ability to have genuine lifelong learning. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, and thank you for the kind comments about, about my book. Uh, I'd never really thought of myself as a sort of Corbyn McDonaldite, but, but perhaps I am rather more of one than I realise. Um, 
so, so, someone else who certainly isn't <laughs> is John McTurnan. Um, so perhaps John, why don't you um, why don't you chip in and then and then and then Emma and then perhaps Alan bring up the rear. Is that all right? Yeah. Well, yes. Um, thanks, David. And um, I'm glad uh, that uh, my comrade John McDonnell um, embraced you uh, as a Corbynite because I thought when you were talking about uh, universities not creating the right skills for the modern economy, you sounded nothing more than a state planner. I've not heard anybody in politics probably since Roy Hattersley thought he should set uh, incomes and prices from the cabinet. Anybody as committed to state um, planning as you were when you set out your view about the about the modern economy and what universities are doing. So the question we were, we're discussing here is a simple one. Are there too many people going to university? And the answer is no. I don't believe there are too many people going to university. If there were, one might want to look at um, the disparities between middle class areas where 80% uh, or more kids can go to university and working class areas where 20% or fewer can go to university. In which case we might say, looking at Windsor and Slough, Windsor overproduces and Slough underproduces. So the answer, if, you're, if the problem you've diagnosed is correct, the answer is to cap Windsor to 40% to allow places for Slough. But I don't think that's what you're arguing for because I think what your argument underpinning it all is um, the other person's children's problem, which is someone else's children uh, are going to university when they shouldn't. Somebody else's kids should go to FE. Somebody else's kids should do a course uh, that's good enough for them. And I think the way, the Dehoton Bar way in which you look, uh, you, you're, 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 is, it, is it fallacious or is it fatuous? Uh, the 1550 rule about going to university. Um, if kids from working class backgrounds want to go to university, then 15, 50, 60, 70% of them should be able to go to university. I'm in the labor movement for one reason, one reason alone, that's to give working class people the opportunities that middle class people take for granted. That's why we expanded higher education. That's why we put universities in places. And one of your previous books, one of your other uh, provocative books talked about you know, somewheres and nowheres. Well, somewheres and anywheres. Everyone somewheres and anywheres. Somewhere. Okay, yeah. yeah, somewheres and anywheres. Well, a university is the ultimate somewhere. It's the University of Sunderland. Uh, it's the University of East Anglia. It's in a place. Um, and just as kids go out of a place to go to a university, kids come into a place to go to a university. So the solution uh, for places which you're worried about is to give them art colleges and universities, not to say their kids shouldn't come from those places and go to university. You, the commitment to expanding university education has probably been the Labour Party's most successful post-industrial, uh, post uh, post-war industrial strategy, that consistent expansion, the Robbins review right through to, to Tony Blair. It's been a view that one of the ways to grow our economy is to create people for a white collar service driven economy, which is what we have, you know, 86% of us work uh, in the private sector. We don't work in the public sector. The private sector uh, is happy to take the, the workers that come from universities and individuals privately choosing to go to those universities, privately choosing to take the debt onto themselves to choose to go to a university course and then go to where they want. Uh, and there's an element of the way you've been talking about this, which, you know, made me think of Shakespeare and reason not the need. It's not up to you to tell somebody why they go to university. I went to university and studied seventh century Irish and I became the political secretary to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, Nobody should tell me I can't study Irish and nobody should say to me that course would not fit you for the modern labor market. I've been perfectly fit for the modern labor market and every job I've done since I, since I stacked shelves in a cooperative uh, when I was going through university. And I think this is the, the issue at the heart of this is are there too many people going to university? No, there aren't. Um, why has this become a political problem? Um, you said we're, we're, there's a mismatch. Well, I tell you, if we, if I need in my lifetime a specialist dementia care nurse, I'd like her or him to have actually done a degree. I think that the professionalization uh, of teaching, of nursing, 
uh, of, of these becoming degree mm -hmm. degree only professions. Uh, the same with policing. This is good for our country. It's not bad for our country. And I think buried in your presentation to open with is is the problem uh, which the right is sent to find with the expansion of higher education is the values issue. And it's not that they think there's a values conflict created between graduates and the families they come from. People are happy to work out their own way and their own lives with their own families. The problem is, uh, and it's open in, in uh, parts of America, and it's definitely open all across the, uh, the academic debate in, in Australia, is that the problem with kids going to university is they come out left wing. And the problem is the facts of life are progressive. And that's the thing <laughs> that center right politicians find really hard to get. That is why we have an England team which is which in its most successful recent formation is majority mixed race. That's why the country has accepted equal marriage after accepting civil partnerships and rejecting homophobic legislation. The facts of life are progressive. And the problem is you, you're trying to legislate against that ballot. Let's not expose too many young people to those facts because they might turn out voting Labour. Uh, they might turn out voting Green. They won't turn out voting Conservative. And so at the heart of this, is a very strange mixture of politics, a, uh, a status desire to dictate what skills there should be being trained for the for the for the for the for a market economy, as well as a view that some people should know their place, uh, and as well as a misunderstanding of the role of universities in a skilled economy. And you know, the robots may be coming, but people have been saying the robots have been coming since the fifties. The, the big Senate inquiries in the United States were in the fifties. Uh, about the robots we're going to come to, to take our jobs. We've still all got jobs, and I reckon in 10 years' time we'll still all be debating this, this topic. Good. All right. Well, thank you. I mean, I found that a mixture of kind of bonkers and insulting, um, but, but, but very stimulating as well. You obviously haven't read the book, because I do have a very long section on, on precisely why I am not in favour of kicking away the ladder, or rather why I think that perfectly worthy instinct of not wanting to kick away the ladder is not actually a very good way of producing public policy. Too much of our policy is actually, in a sense, the bad conscience of the grammar school period. It's a kind of reaction against the grammar school period. So let's not, so let's sort of, it, it's the equivalent of let's send everybody to grammar school. Um, and, it's, and as I say, it's both politically, and I'm, against, I'm, against, I'm against grammar schools but, too, but, but I, was, I, was, I was simply well, responding. I mean, I but simply you just, responding, we just kind of moved it up. Argument, We've just kind of moved it up a, a, a few years. So we're sending everyone to university instead of sending everyone to grammar school. But anyway, anyway, uh, anyway <laughs> Emma, your go. Thank you very much. And, and I hope you'll um, take it in the way it's intended, David, if I am uh, direct with my, my opinions also, because I think having, uh, having a good conversation and disagreeing disagreeably <laughs> is a good thing for us oh, all absolutely. to be able yeah, to yeah. do. Yeah, 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 no. Um, but I do think this is a false argument and a false divide. I think the, the premise and the idea that graduates are not workers ignores the fact that many graduates are professional occupation graduates for one. I think the divide into head and hands is also overly simplistic. And I think it would be easier for all of us if life only was that simple. But I think one of the main weaknesses in the argument is that it does fail to recognize the higher technical education that higher education institutions do actually provide. But I'm quite concerned that this false divide is, a, is damaging. And I see it probably in a, in a similar way to John as attack on working class aspiration and could be viewed, though I'm sure, genuinely sure this isn't your intention, but it could be viewed as a way of keeping working class people in their place. Because to advocate for an outdated notion of academic education for an elite minority and vocational education for the minority will not prepare us for the fourth industrial revolution despite it being very successful for the first industrial revolution. And of course, key workers should have greater value in society. Absolutely no doubt whatsoever, wholeheartedly agree. But I do find it uh, slightly galling that we're saying this after a decade of austerity and increased poverty, that suddenly now we've recognized that there are people in society who have been left behind and deserve to have more worth. And I wouldn't blame a graduate from Barnsley for the fact that our key workers have been underpaid and undervalued for such a very long time. Um, and before we sort of talk about the further restrictions on opportunities for the working class people, I, I think it is worth noting, and I think this was a point that John mentioned, the participation rates for 18 and 19 year olds in English working class towns, an average of 32%, which is well below the national average of 42%. 
So as John said, is the problem that we have too many graduates or is the problem that working class communities don't have the, mo as the access to university that they really should have? And I say this coming from, of course, as you know, Hull, because I believe it fundamentally matters who gets to go to university. And the social attitude surveys show that it's graduates who think too many go to university. Just those who've already graduated believe that fewer people should have that same access. Whereas actually it's underrepresented groups feel more should have the opportunities. And surely we should be seeking to widen opportunities for those underrepresented groups rather than restricting them. But I do fear this sort of latest debate on higher education is feels another like playing out of the culture war within universities. And I find that this whole approach to education is limited because it doesn't see education as a common good and only as a private good benefiting only the individual. Now, in terms of what I feel and what I think, and what uh, Labour's view on what universities are for, I think they serve three purposes. And if I can try and summarise as quickly as possible. So one being the soft global power, the way they contribute to our economic growth, innovation and prepare us for the fourth industrial revolution. I think that's one of the purposes of our universities. The second, of course, is that personal ambition, aspiration, supporting working class people, supporting different people in the communities and social mobility. But the third and the third that this, um, I feel some of your work, if I can be as bold as to say so, David, misses, is the public good, the important role, the civic role that universities play in their community, the way they provide knowledge, skills, support and resources for local communities. I'll give a very quick example of something Hull University does because I know it very well. Hull is flat, we get flooded quite a lot. So one of the things the university is doing is working with fire and rescue to provide looking at flood resilience, something that benefits the city of Hull using the expertise and the knowledge that the university has to pull together different experts in an area that supports its local economy and the people who live there. And I think the other thing that is worth mentioning as well is universities don't just provide um, uh, education for undergraduates, they also employ them. And in some areas in the country, the universities are one of the few places where you can actually access a graduate level job. But what I'd really like to discuss and where my thinking is at to give you an idea of, of what's, what's going on in my head, um, is how can universities contribute to social mobility without geographical mobility? And in, in that point, I, I, I feel maybe you and I I want to stay on the page. I think this narrative of social mobility means you have to move away from home and leave your family and leave your friends and leave where you came from, I think is, is outdated and wrong. And I think there's a lot more in terms of the civic role universities do to support this idea that you can be socially mobile and stay where you live in the same way, obviously, I did. So how do you grow local economies? And I was really interested in a report that came out only hours ago, actually, showing that 20,039 graduate startups in the last five years came from these modern universities. And I've been talking to some universities about how they're supporting entrepreneurship to actually grow the local economy in that area. And I know Manchester University is a good example of this. So how do we create an education ecosystem, as I like to call it, with further education, higher education schools and adult education collaborating, not competing, sharing skills and knowledge and creating clear pathways into employment and learning opportunities? How can local and national industrial strategies inform education provision? And on, on that, I echo some of the thoughts from Orga about there does need to be some sort of information sharing and looking at the needs of the local economy, the national economy and, and how higher education can contribute to that. And of course, how can universities further develop their civic role? How can universities contribute to the need to retrain and reskill, especially, and again, I agree with you, David, looking at mature and part-time provision. Looking, we could potentially build on the hybrid model that's already been offered by universities to eliminate cold spots in the country and push out opportunity even further. And I do agree that this sort of outdated notion of university being a boarding school model where everyone moves away from three years. And I do also agree with the idea that we are an outlier in terms of residential. And I think offering more opportunities locally is something I can support. How can higher education and further education be incentivized to put on higher technical, uh, technical education qualifications when, let's be honest, there simply hasn't been the investment or resources. As part of the Education Select Committee, I went to Germany uh, as one of our, uh, our investigation into fourth industrial revolution and we went around colleges and we went and saw the investment that's going into these colleges right now in retraining and reskilling and preparing people for oh. the fourth industrial revolution oh. that simply hasn't happened in this country and i do think we're on the cusp of that point aren't we we're on that cusp of the point when a higher education has moved from being elite to being mass to just about ready to become universal 
and I don't think universal education is something that we should be frightened of or something we should be running fearful from. And these are some of the things I, you know, I will be looking at as Shadow Education Minister. And my final comment I just want to leave you with is I believe the problem lies in not over educating our youth, but in leaving those at the bottom with no path up. Good. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, well, how, how about um, from the cold face, as it were, mm. Alan, from uh, FE College in Oldham, how, how do you see it and what do you think of everything that's been said so far? Um, <laughs> I don't know where to start <laughs> after all that. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, OK, I'm going to start off with a kind of observation, really, because um, when you run an FE College, one of the things you spend a lot of your time doing is explaining to people many of you have been to university, what an FE college actually does. And uh, you spend a, a ridiculous amount of your time explaining to people that, you know, people who become bricklayers and electricians and often go on to university to become nurses and do other things, go into FE colleges. That's where they learn those things. And one of the reasons that people don't always understand that is that there is a huge divide between the world of graduates and the world of non-graduates. My two sons are at university. I speak to my eldest son. He's now 24. Hard, That's one of them ringing at exactly the wrong moment. So let me turn them off. Um, so um, how many friends of theirs they have from school who didn't go to university? None. And this is not, this is not a reflection of them. This is commonplace. When you, when you talk to graduates, they know graduates. They're friends with graduates. You talk to non-graduates, they predominantly know non-graduates. There's some very big divides. Um, I refer to the point earlier somebody mentioned about grammar schools. The least talked about inequality in education today is the fact that at 16, those with the lowest GCSE grades get funneled into one part of the education system, while the others are funneled into another part, which is predominantly about university. Um, that is, is uh, you don't see any social mobility commission reports on it. You see very little discussion of it, um, and yet, the same arguments apply to this division as applied to the 11 plus. All the same arguments about cognitive ability and the other skills and so on all apply. The students that come to my college are no necessarily less intellectually able than the ones that go to the neighbouring sixth form college to do A levels, but they've got a different experience which has led them to where they are. And we then rediscover their amazing talents and they very often go off and do better than their counterparts who have followed a different route. But the point I really want, then want to get to is that. It's very interesting that when you start to introduce graduates to the world of non-graduates, then there's a little bit of snobbery attached. But then there's also sometimes some irritation when they realise that actually some of their um, school friends have followed a different route and actually earn more money than them, um, have a, a more interesting jobs than they do, um, and uh, have got better cars, better houses, and done better in life. That's not always the case that that happens, but it does happen. And then people start to, I think, start to ask some harder questions. Why is it then that we're all funneled in one route when actually it doesn't suit everybody? And I want to touch on a couple of things that I think, I'm going to throw this open as a challenge to everybody, I hope in a friendly way. Um, I think you've all got an incredibly romantic view of university. I really do. I think, and I, I'm, not, I'm not going to suggest that universities don't do amazing things. They do phenomenally amazing things. What better time to have lived during a pandemic of the kind we had than now when we have universities all over the world racing to find a vaccination within record time? We're just incredibly lucky to live in a world where people have that level of skill and knowledge and ability. So I'm not, I don't want to in the slightest bit criticise on that front, but I do think things are out of kilter. I think John was absolutely right when he mentioned earlier that actually university for most people, for most young people, is about coming of age. It's a coming of age experience. The other two things that people cite it for, which is transmission of cultural knowledge and preparation for work. I'm not sure it's that good at either of those two things. It's brilliant as a coming of age experience, which is why so many people that have been through it have an incredibly romantic yeah. view of its value yeah. because that's their experience. Mm. They had a great time. They met great friends. They reinvented themselves. They left their parents, often left the neighborhood they'd grown up in. They become a different person. They find what they see as their life's values. One of the problems is that is at the cost of forgetting sometimes some of those other things and those other people who are living in the same world, breathing the same air, in the same labour market, and 
it creates, I think, some artificial and un uh, unhelpful divides. And I think the second point I'd make is that I think you're all using the word university when actually what you mean is routes to high skilled work. And I don't think they're the same thing. Mm. You can you can have routes to high skilled work that are not about going to university, surely. We might argue that we don't have enough of them. We might argue that we actually haven't spent much time talking about them. And there's something really important at the bottom of this, which I, I think is worth mentioning. So, um, John, you again mentioned grammar school, secondary modern, technical school. Technical education is always mentioned as if it's just doing stuff with your hands or your head or your heart, your heart and not with your head. Well, let me go back to the 1920s, a very famous educational debate between um, Sneddon and John Dewey over the future of technical education in America. The debate was won by Sneddon, who was a functionalist. He believed that technical education just <coughs> was about <coughs> doing jobs in industry. John Dewey was the visionary who believed that actually through work and work-related oh, education, yeah. you created citizens, citizens who had skills, but also understood their role in the world. We have completely lost that in this country. Um, you can trace it through the history of technical qualifications, the introduction of the MVQ, for example, um, basically took the knowledge bit out of the qualification altogether, and knowledge becomes something that you only do if you go through a university route. Some of the changes we're seeing in qualifications are now starting to redress that balance. And hopefully, some of the changes around T-levels, apprenticeships and other things can go further down that road. But we do, we really have lost this notion that there is any other way of developing as a person, not just in terms of a job or an occupation, but your personal development can't be delivered in any other way rather than university. But that isn't the experience of the apprentices at Rolls-Royce, for example, or, or the elite apprenticeship programs that we're starting to see develop over the country. It's not the experience of many young people who find their first time the thing that they're really good at when they, for example, get their level three electrical engineering apprenticeship. They've had an equally transformational experience. They just don't have the um, um, vantage point to shout about it as much as people have been to university. So my challenge is, actually, don't we need to start to get to grips with the fact that we're over-romanticizing university, we're not spending enough time on the educational and human development aspects of technical learning, which can be done in much more imaginative, creative, and often uh, ways, Emma, which link in with your point, that you may not need to leave home, you may choose to at some point, but you, may, you shouldn't have to to, to, get, to get a high school job, um, and, and therefore offer more opportunities to more people. Um, I do think I'll leave you with a final thought on this. I wonder a lot about this question, and it goes back to your point, John, about why so many people still choose to go to university. And I, particularly there's this debate taking place about the kind of German style skill system that we would like to have. Do we want to have it? I'm not sure, but we think we might like to have it. But there's something about the German system that strikes me as very, very different to ours. And I'm not an expert. I just have to kind of read about this and try and understand it as best as I can while running a college. But in the German system, the trade unions, the employers through the chambers of commerce and the educationalists sit down and they design the skills required to do a, a, a distinct set of jobs. Its downside is it can be a bit inflexible in terms of responding to labour market change. But its upside is that those jobs are relatively well protected so people can actively choose them. Whereas in our system, that labour market protection isn't there for a lot of ordinary jobs. Do you know that anybody can become a hairdresser? But if you want to be an accountant, you've got loads of protection. There's loads, to, loads of things to protect the elite route into accountancy, very little to protect a hairdresser. And those issues about occupational regulation may well sit at the bottom of some of these choices because the reason why so many people choose university is one is it's a good time when you're young and who's going to not choose that? But two, is that actually getting a generalist qualification that gives you flexibility, gives you more protection than choosing jobs that might get uh, eroded in one way or another. And I would leave that with you because I don't think the problems are always sat with education. I think some of these problems are sat with the way we think about the labour market. Uh, that's really good. Um, uh, some uh, four very good perspectives. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a sec, John. Uh, I, I, I do just want to respond to John McTernan because I do find this a bit exasperating. I mean, I, I guess I set myself up for this um, this kind of class obsession um, that John has, that David Willits and other people have, Andrew Adonis. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, but it really isn't a matter of 
um, you know, reducing. Uh, I mean, it's clearly a good thing that we have uh, we have a bigger cognitive elite now than we had when I went to college or when John went to college um, back in the back in the 1970s. Only what eight or nine percent did. Um, but but I think we've got to try and think about this without falling back always into, into obsessions about class. I mean, I think obviously. Um, the most academically able people from whatever background should go into our elite universities, which remain a very important part of British life. But to say, you know, as Willits does, as John does, as, as Adonis does, that, you know, that we should go up to 60, 70, 80 percent, I think it's just to so much miss the point. And, you know, if I can, if I can trade insults here, um, you say I'm kicking away the ladder. I think what you're doing is a form of, uh, you know, as Alan was implying, it's a form of narcissism. It's a saying, you know, Go to college like I did, you know, study Sanskrit, um, and then become, uh, you know, a, a political advisor. A tiny number of people can only ever do that, um, and it's actually damaging. You, you know, it's 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 square pegs in round holes, or the other way around. Um, you know, we, we've got to, we've got to align things better. And the idea that this is some kind of sort of Soviet state planning—I mean, it's a ridiculously naive sort of methodological individualism, John. I mean, our choices are affected by institutions. Our choices are affected by the incentives, whether they're financial or cultural signals or whatever. That the reason why so many people go to university is because 40% of jobs in our economy and all the best ones are graduate only. I mean, of course, people are going to go down that path. And my point is, let's, let's, shift the let's shift the status. Let's raise the status of some of the other occupations, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, th these are, you know, th before we sent such a large chunk of school leavers to university, we had hundreds of thousands of people every year doing HNDs and HNCs, which required, you know, really quite, you know, serious, uh, uh, had a serious academic element to them. Uh, in those day, in the old days, in, people would go to polytechnics and, and do HNDs and HNCs while also working, um, and that system worked pretty well actually. Um, and I mean, all I'm saying is that we should adapt our post-school education system, make it, you know, make it more differentiated, so that we actually, so we, we actually create the skills that are actually required. Um, of course, uh, you know, th there is there is a lot to be said for for for, for Going to university and studying, you know, like I say, Middlemarch or Kant, or uh, I mean, you know, th th these are wonderful and lovely things. But um, not everybody, not that many people actually want to do that, and and the economy can only uh, carry a certain number of people. Now, some of the cost, some of that cost is now borne by the individual, but only quite a small part of it actually. Um, you know, we're still funding a huge amount of that, so. Um, um, I, you know, it, it's, it, it, it really isn't about trying to, well, I mean, it is partly about trying to guide choice, but, but choice is always guided by institutions, by, by, by politics to some extent, and by the allocation of resources in society. I'm saying that we should, we should, we should adjust that allocation a bit um, and, and create a better alignment, both economically and, and in terms of our politics and our culture. Because I, I think the John Willits Adonis approach is partly responsible for bloody Brexit, actually. It's responsible for, for populism. I mean, the kind of divides reinforced by our uh, residential university system, by the, by the cultural divides. As you say, John, I mean, most people who go to university come out with a much more liberal worldview, and there's nothing wrong Excellent. with that. Um, but I'm afraid. You know, if common sense was progressive, then why on earth, you know, are progressive parties not always in power? I mean, um, common sense is also conservative. Common sense, really is, is a, political common sense, is a lot of different things. It perhaps has progressive, progressive aspects to it. It also has a lot of small c conservative aspects to it. And it's the failure, actually, of a lot of the graduate class to acknowledge that that I think has been a real booster to, to populism. So I, I think your your um, you're narcissistic and you're a creator of populism is my, is my, in, my, is my insulting uh, response to your insults. Um, um, I absolutely agree with what Emma said about the universities being responsible for reviving many of our post-industrial northern cities. I mean, you know, Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle, I mean, they're now kind of, they're, they're university towns. I mean, Sheffield had, what, 
I've, I mean, I do talk about this in the book. I mean, Sheffield had 60,000, 45,000 steel workers and 4,000 students 30 or 40 years ago. Now it's completely the reverse. It's got 2,000 steel workers and, uh, and, and, and 40,000 students or whatever. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not saying universities are not important, but, uh, but I, mean, do, I mean, perhaps we should, just to get back to where we go from here, I mean, we do have this demographic bulge coming. We've got an extra 300,000 18 year olds. I think the answer, I mean, as Alan Francis says, uh, it's not so much about um, whether you go to university or not, it's preparing people, as many people as possible, for high, for, for, for useful, purposeful, high skill employment of various kinds. And at the moment, we have one very narrow system, very very narrow funnel, it's three or four year degree, taught by academics, usually residential, very, very academicized courses often, which, which, which may be fine in some areas, I think are dysfunctional in other areas, you know, if you're training to be a construction manager, why do you do so much accountancy and sort of general business studies? You don't need to do that. We should have a much more flexible system than we have now. Um, and not, you know, and, and, not, uh, and, and not send everybody to three, four year, um, uh, um, a, a, to do the three, four year academic degrees. And of, of course, I mean, in terms of, of, of social mobility and social class, I mean, these are partly separate questions to do with the prior attainment at, at, at secondary school level. Obviously, I mean, I believe that, that as, as many people as possible who are really, really academically able should go, you know, should go to Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial and, Kings and whatever whatever social class they're from, and actually fewer middle class kids. You know, it's, it's become too automatic, too much of a rite of passage for middle and upper middle class kids. And actually, I think one of the promising things is, you know, you may start to see the change from there, from the kind of top of the socioeconomic spectrum. More and more kids thinking, actually, uh, you know, this is this is not worth. I mean, it, uh, you know, be better. I'd be better off going off and be more interesting to go off and be an artisanal baker than to, to spend three or four years doing a humanities degree, which you, know, you, you, you forget most of it anyway within about three seconds of leaving college. Um, so, so let's use the demographic bulge to reduce the proportion of kids going to university and broaden it out, try and you know, shift the, the cultural and status signals so that those other forms of post-school education are considered just as relevant, if possibly more relevant, than, 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 going, than, than, than going to a classical university and perhaps not, you know, and coming out with a degree that doesn't get you the kind of occupation you want. Isn't, isn't that a, a reasonable proposition, Emma? Hello. Um, I feel I might need to go into teacher mode slightly here. Um, mm. and drawing on my years, I've been a primary teacher and just remind everyone to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, <laughs> I, I thought I'm, I did that quite well. <laughs> I, uh, and I'm not sure how romantic I, I feel about uh, university because I think, say, 11 years on the chalk face kind of makes you feel less romantic about education. And thank you so much, Alan. There was much I agreed with of what you said there. And I think for too long, further education has been ignored and neglected. I'm wholeheartedly on your side with that. And I think there were some other points I agreed with as well. I mean, yes, we do need more level four and five higher technical education, absolutely. And in my opening remarks, I talked about sort of this education ecosystem of how can further education and higher education work together. And there will be some courses that will be better delivered by the university and there'll be some that are better delivered by further education. And by collaborating and actually saying where are the strengths and weaknesses, who can deliver what in the best way, I think is a really the way to go forward. But to draw on the point of David asking why, where did they go? I, I do think it is down to the funding and the maintenance system that we set up. You can get funding very easily to do a degree and you can get maintenance loans very easy to do a degree. I think the reason H&Ds and H&Cs disappeared was because there was no mechanism, there was no funding available, yeah. no maintenance system. And, and so I think some people blame students and the free market and consumer choice, but I think students had a limited options because of the funding system that was put in place. And I think if we really do want to encourage more people to take higher technical education, which I think is, I think we all agree is a good thing, then we do need to look at how do we fund it? How do we support people? How do we make it happen? And I obviously agree with this. Um, this idea around, I think everyone sort of romanticizes about being young. I'm sure whatever it is, whether it's going to university or when they first went out, everyone has this romantic idea of everything was, oh, it was so much better when we were younger. And of course, music from the Britpop era was the best type of music. Um, 
but I think being being more serious about this, I think we do need to see universities as being there for lifelong and not just something you do when you're 18 and go and live three years away. I think that's absolutely true. But I, I think the, the point, and I want to re-emphasize it because I do feel it's been missed again, is we're, we're not recognizing importantly enough the civic role and the public good that universities bring. We seem to be sort of skirting around this and talking about it in a very sort of consumeristic model. I pay, I buy, what do I get at the end of it? Instead of, well, actually, what is that university doing for the area? And we've seen during COVID-19, I know David mentioned the vaccines, which are you know absolutely brilliant, but in sort of other universities, all the nurses that are graduating this year, all the key workers that they've put out there and the students. I mean, I think it's University of Bradford was making a hand sanitizer for the local community. I mean, there are hundreds of examples of universities doing things to support the public good. And and so and I I do think that does I think they can do more. And I'm certainly not as Labour opposition arguing for the status quo. I think there are many things I'd like to see changed. But I do think it's important to recognise that the purpose of universities, as I said in my opening remarks, is, yes, global soft power, economic and innovation, um, but mm. also individualistic. But third, the public good as well. What do they give to the community and how do they support communities? Let's have the two Johns, red John and then blue John. <laughs> Am I the only one who's read the book? No, no. <laughs> Alan, have you? Okay. <laughs> um, Alan, by the way, I, I did my A-levels at an FE college when I was on shift, and on my reference to technical schools was actually what happened is you got divided up. The technical kids have got a good technical education, but actually it was quite narrow. And then at a grammar yeah. school, you didn't get the technical education. It was ridiculous division. Anyway, let me just quote from the book, because... I get from your book, David, I might get this wrong, that this is not the preventing large numbers of going into higher education. It is the nature of that higher yeah. education and the, the institutional reform that you're coming. And you quote Haldane, who I have an awful lot of time for from Bank of England. Let me read it. Those skills will be social, technical, every bit as much as cognitive, with head, hand and heart sharing equal billing. Will you agree? It would, in short, need to be a plural rather than singular, a multi-university rather than university. You go on to say, um, the old generalist model of the 19th century educated person is coming back. This is now called cross-domain knowledge, often combines both scientific and narcissistic forms of thinking. You then go on to say, and what about education for life and citizenship? I want, a, I want an institutional setting which enables people to go into higher education, which has a quality of esteem across the range of skills and qualities that people have and that they can do throughout their life. That's what I got from your book. Maybe I misread it. I don't know. No, no I, don't, I don't think you did. I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, although one point I should perhaps have emphasized more, I mean, I did, I, I mentioned it three or four times, but I mean, obviously head, hand and heart are a kind of artificial distinction. Yes, I mean, they you know, are. Every single act that a human being does, you know, involves cognitive, emotional and embodied um, functions uh, so but I think it does you know it, it helps sometimes to to create these sort of heuristic devices these abstractions to to perhaps you know to, to help us better understand oh, so what, what's going the, on but, but anyway um, emphasis, I, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, John you you you're, you you deserve a comeback at me yeah look I'm sorry um, you confused me with Lords Adonis and Willis <laughs> I'm, I'm not in the House of Lords um, <laughs> Uh, I used to create peerages. Uh, that's well, I actually, I mean, you're, you're all three people I respect enormously. Um, no. but, uh, but, uh, and look, my, 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 my point uh, is not, I'm not a class-obsessed um, uh, politician. No, 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 no um, respectable Blair I would be. My issue is if you say there's too many people going to university or there's too many university places, which is really the, the, the question posed in, 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 in this meeting, um, something has to give. And I'm, if you're going to say we only have this number of places, then I'm quite happy to see Windsor capped, Dulwich capped, Peckham given more places, um, Hull given more places. But I don't think that's what the argument is. And I think we can have, we can argue about the role of FE and the respect for FE and investment in FE. And to be honest, um, you could guarantee if you cut university funding, you wouldn't get an extra penny for FE and definitely not for sixth form colleges who are, who are massively uh, underfunded. And so I think it's a kind of setting the sectors against each other as opposed to what might be the, 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 the social contribution uh, that they make. I'm, I'm not 
um, uh, going to really sort of resolve from my, my view that actually we shouldn't be telling young people what, what, what they should choose to do with degrees. I think my, my son who went to a university in Manchester and studied language is now a primary school teacher. That's been good for him. And it's almost certainly good for the, uh, the working class kids in Rotherhide that he was one of the 8% of kids uh, state school in Britain when he studied who did two A-levels in languages. There's all kinds of inequality of uh, distribution of access to education, which I think we should, as a Labour Party, be rightly concerned by. But the one thing I'd like to finish on is just the, the fetishization of Germany as a model for Britain um, is one of those kind of zombie policy myths that should be nailed once and for all. Um, the the Mittelstadt companies, the family-owned companies, redistribute money to themselves, not to workers. The owners of the families keep the money, uh, and workers don't get it either through wages or through the, the pensions, which you, you get money back through your share earnings as a British worker. And secondly, we fetishize the German education skills system. You know, my, uh, my, my son's girlfriend, uh, he met at university uh, in the Netherlands. She would say, and his observation would be, that the most socially mobile educational system in Europe judging for the people they work, they, they, they study with, is the British one, which does have mobility and not perfect, but it's got better. And the German one of si assigning people to streams is as brutal as the old fashioned Finnish one was, which they got rid of uh, when, they, when they made people choose at 10, whether they, were gonna, whether they were gonna go into a technical stream or not. We've got flaws in our education system the one thing we don't have a problem with is the number of people going to higher education. The distribution of that access, yes, possibly. Um, the, the, whether, whether we know how to deliver on skills, yes, possibly that, that, is, that, that is definitely an issue that we have too. Um, do we have uh, governments coming back again and again to try to, to resolve this issue? Yes, why? It's a hard problem because by and large, the problems that aren't hard in society and politics. We've privatized correctly. We've given away industries to be run by industrial managers. Um, this is a hard problem to resolve, and I think it isn't made easy if we if we make it a binary, are there too many or are there too few people going to university? Good. Well, um, I think we've more or less come to the end. Um, I think. Uh, if anyone, um, uh, have, we, have we got a couple more minutes? Uh, yeah, do, do, everybody want to? I mean, I'll, I'll take that, John, as your as your final comment. Does everyone else just want a couple of sentences to I, sort of I, draw draw the event? I would like to just throw out yeah. a final comment, David, if we can. About um, I, t I take the point about the point that people are making about university social mobility. Um, slightly less concerned, less convinced by that term, if I'm honest, but about the notion of creating more opportunity for people. Um, but if we look at the three functions that people cite commonly as the arguments for university, they'd say transmission of culture, because it is important that people read Shakespeare and they read uh, seventh, seventh century Irish studies, John, I think you said, um, and other subjects. Um, there's the preparation for work, as in it gets you a, a, jo a job with high skills. And there's the personal development argument. But actually, for the majority of people that go, it's only the personal development bit that really works. Very few people come out with a real love of their subjects or knowledge of their subject. Most people forget what they've studied at university very quickly. And in terms of work-related education, nearly every single person who goes to university has to start work-related education after they finish. So teachers train to be teachers, Accountants trained to be accountants, lawyers trained to be lawyers. We understand all of those things. But here's my question. Why does work-related learning happen at 21 for the elite that end up at university, but at 16 or 18 for everybody else? And, um, and that goes back to my point about the inequality between these two strands, where we've just not thought that through very well. And if the personal development bit is the rationale for university, why aren't we sending everybody without yeah. selection? Why aren't we just saying, let everybody go then? Because why more where is the are. equality and fairness in saying some people get this elite, super personal development opportunity, but others it's denied to them on the basis of what cognitive skills, but that's not what the economy wants. We want a round, more rounded group of people. So it's either we have to send less people or we send everybody and start their work-related education at 21, in which case we've just upped the school leaving age to 21. Well, that's a very interesting idea. Um... Uh, I, mean, I mean, if I can make a final comment, I mean, I, um, 
I mean, one thing I want to knock on the head is this idea that, that expand, expanding higher education has not been good for social mobility. It's actually helped to reverse social mobility. Uh, I mean, cause and effect in social mobility is very, very difficult to work out. No one, I mean, people talk confidently about social mobility doing this or that, but uh, it's, it's very, very hard to know what's going on. Um, but to the extent that we do know, I mean, most of the social mobility researchers would say that one of the reasons why social mobility seems to have slowed down um, somewhat in the last couple of decades is partly there's less room at the top. There's actually fewer professional type university jobs being created, but also because the middle class and upper middle class have completely monopolized universities. O obviously, some working class people go too. And of course, I'd be in favor of, of having more people from Slough and fewer people from Windsor, so long as it doesn't actually mean, if, if we're talking about proper elite academic education, so long as it doesn't actually mean further reducing standards. And that obviously depends on the prior prior educational attainment at secondary school level. Um, so all, all of these things get sort of tied up together. Um, but um, yeah, it, 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 it's been a very, very mixed story, to say the least, on social mobility. Um, and um, yeah, my son is also studying to be a primary school teacher, having studied philosophy at Edinburgh for three years. Um, um, so um, yeah, we have that in common, John. If I can add, I was a primary school teacher, so oh. there we go. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, and also, my, my, my son and John's are also help, uh, helping to shift the balance a bit away from it being a very, very heavily female occupation. I think it's about 85% female at the yes. moment and it would be far but better if it was you know 60 40 or something the only the only argument about that about us being too diverted david is people say there should be more men in primary schools but we don't seem to have they don't seem to have a trouble getting to become head teachers where they're overly mm. despite <laughs> being underrepresented in the primary school profession they're overrepresented as head teachers or deputy heads but we, we it's die, the same in nursing as well it's just the sort of glass escalator problem yeah yeah, mm, yeah. yeah. Um, i think i think though uh, i just say alan made a really really interesting point around exams at 16 and how we divide people. I think that is, oh. is something I, it's not actually my brief, so I won't speak on someone else's, but it's something I'm personally, as I say, having worked in education, being really uh, interested. And I just want to finish by just mentioning something I was reading recently, more as a where I'm thinking than a, than a policy announcement. It's this idea of graduateness and being employability and what's a graduateness that, why do people want to employ graduates? And I think if you were you have it working effectively of course you have the knowledge needed and you have what you call the hard skills how do you do whatever it is but the squidgy skills that go with it so the collaboration the presentation the teamwork the oracy all of those things that you learn through forums and pres you know at university and character attitude behavior personality and i think what higher education can do really well is build these up to be as good as they possibly can be because the big elephant in the room that we're all ignoring is one of the reasons that some people uh, move on in life and become more successful is social capital. That's the thing that none of us are talking about. Some people have higher levels of social capital than others. So I think education in whichever form, higher education or further education, and however we do it, needs to build on giving people as much knowledge, hard skills, squidgy skills and character development as possible to compete mm. against those born with advantage and born with that social capital. Mm. I love the concept, I love the concept of squidgy well, skills. On Alan's well. I do want everyone to have the opportunity, but I want us to develop that opportunity into a way it's meaningful for people. Uh, so, you know, that's what lifelong learning should be all about. So I do want every one of our young people to have that opportunity if they so choose. But actually, I think the choice at the moment institutionally doesn't reflect what they need. And that's why it's an institutional change Mm. into a finance change as well. We all want that sort of William Morris type person coming out of our educational system, that whole breadth of skills and hopes and desires and enjoyments and cultural commitment, that sort of thing. But I think it's the institutional change. It's not about saying only so many will go to university. I think everybody should have that higher education opportunity. And it's the change of the institutional arrangement and mm. funding to enable that to happen. Exactly. Not and we all, we're all quoting our own kids. My son who came out of university is now working in industry. Actually, he has kept all his mates who didn't go to university and did their apprenticeships and all that sort of thing. Uh, we live and work in a working class community and people have held together in, in that way. And But at the same time, I, you know, the point that Alan made as well, it was that much tougher for those kids to get the apprenticeship than it was to go into the university as it now is. That can't be right. Mm, yeah. 
And exactly, I mean, as, as, you're, as you're saying, John, I mean, the, you know, s someone leaves school and for whatever reason they don't either want to or can't go to university, they haven't got the, the they haven't passed the right exams, they go into some sort of software job, pr perhaps a pr pretty grunt occupation initially, but they kind of, they develop and they, you know, they're, they're capable, they get promotion and so on. And then, you know, why not then go to university in your late 20s or early 30s to, to, to sort of, to study what lies behind what you've been doing, you know, do a computer science degree, you know, having having worked, you know, having done coding or or, or software at a kind of lower level, and the, and then you can move up, um, you know, 10, 15 years later, rather than concentrating so much of our of our higher education spend on 18, 19 year olds. So we've actually seen a fall off. It isn't actually technically true. People keep saying that the increase in fees in 2012 did not reduce working class participation in higher education. It did actually decrease working class participation in higher education if you look at older people as well. I mean, the, 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 little, the little bit of sophistry is that it didn't reduce the number of 18, 19 year olds going into higher education. But if you look at the broader picture, it did. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, uh, anyway, that was a good, uh, good conversation. Um, and um Let's see we're all Corbinites now you can uh, say <laughs> um, uh, no exactly and uh, <laughs> uh, uh thank you very much um oh, I, I hope uh, i hope everybody out there uh, i hope anyone who's left <laughs> watching this <laughs> enjoyed it uh, anybody who wants to watch it again it'll be on our website uh we had a very good discussion yesterday by the way uh with uh, with um um caroline flint and deborah mattinson about the um uh, about Same the Red thing. Wall, about the Red Wall. Um, that's also on the Policy Exchange website if you want to go and have a look at that. And, uh, and Sebastian Payne, sorry. Um, anyway, thanks all of you for doing that. That was great. Thank you, um, Thank you very um, much. Thank you, everybody. Nice yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.